Hello and welcome to Nunley Math. I am Aaron Nunley, your host. I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us as we are looking at um, how to use what we've learned about algebra and equation solving in order to solve application problems. Um, we talked in our previous video about word problems with stated relationships. And we said that in most word problems, we can uh, look for very specific items in the problem that are going to help us solve it. Um, we can look for information sentences, useless information sentences, relationship sentences, and questions and problems. And by thinking in this format, it makes the problems a lot easier to solve because we can go through and eliminate useless information. We can use the question to give us a variable. We can find the relationship question or use the relationship sentence to give us the equation. And we fill in uh, gaps in the equation using uh, the information sentences. And if you want more information about that method for problem solving, you're going to want to go back and watch the previous lesson um, on how to do that. Today we're going to look at a different type of application problem, and that is those problems that have assumed relationships. Assumed relationships. Um, when we talk about assumed relationships, we have essentially the same pattern to our problems or to our paragraphs or to the word problem, but in um, these cases, the relationship is missing from the problem. There is no relationship that's given to us. So we still eliminate useless information. The question still gives us the variable, but it's assumed that you know something ahead of time about the relationship. They don't specifically state for you how to write the algebraic equation. Instead, they are assuming you know how to attack or approach the problem. And we're still going to use the information they provided to fill in gaps in that relationship. The challenge with this type of application problem is this. Do you actually know the type of relationship that the problem expects you to know? In a stated relationship problem, like we looked at in the last videos, you don't have to um, necessarily have the prior knowledge about the story in order to solve it because everything you need is given to you in the problem. But in these assumed relationships, if you know the relationship they're assuming you know, or uh, they're assuming you know, then you're in very, very good shape. But if you don't know that assumed relationship, you find yourself in a very difficult spot because all the information that you need is not actually given to you. So one of the approaches that I take with assumed relationship problems is I like to talk about the different types of patterns that um, that they like to ask in these questions. I want to talk about these different type of, types of relationships because as we become familiar with the different types of assumed relationships there are and we memorize those and, and, be, and uh, get some practice with them, you're going to find that the assumed relationship problems can actually be much simpler than the stated relationships because you don't necessarily have to do a direct translation of the problem, you just have to look at the problem and remember, oh, this fits into this type of pattern. We're going to look at two or three of those today. We'll look at a different type in the next video, another type in the following video, and then at the end we'll kind of wrap that up with um, a discussion of all the different types of problems that, that can be solved using Algebra 1. I shouldn't use the word all, but um, the most common types of problems that are solved using the skills we have right now with equation solving. Here's a very common question that's asked in Algebra 1. It says the sum of three consecutive integers is 264. What are the numbers? Notice you're given this statement here, the sum, we know that's addition, of three consecutive integers. We know this is an equal sign, and we know this is 264. The problem we have is there's this big gap in knowledge in the center of the problem, three consecutive integers. If you know what consecutive integers are, and you've seen that pattern before, this is a, actually a very simple problem to solve. However, if that expression, that term three consecutive integers is foreign or new to you, this could become a very, very difficult or even impossible problem to solve. So let's talk first about what the consecutive integer pattern is. If I were to give you three numbers like 1, 2, and 3, consecutive integers are numbers that appear in a sequence one right after the other. 
1 is always followed by 2, which is always followed by 3. Notice these are integers. We're not talking about decimals or fractions or anything like that right now. We're just talking about three integers that appear in a row, 1, 2, 3. Or maybe 7, 8, 9. Or 21, 22, 23 or 71, 72, and 73. We could even use negative numbers like negative 7, negative 6, negative 5. These are each examples of consecutive integers. But what I want us to do is I want us to look at the pattern that emerges. If you look at what's in this first column, 1, 7, 21, and x, we can refer to this first value as x. When we look at how the second column compares to the first column, you should notice that the same thing is happening every single time. Do you see that? No matter what your first value is, the second number in the sequence is always one bigger. 1 plus 1 is 2, 7 plus 1 is 8, 21 plus 1 is 22, 71 plus 1 is 72. So we can refer to this as being x plus 1. Notice x is the first value, x plus 1 is that middle value because every item in this column is one bigger than the x. Look over here at this third column, 3, 9, 23, and 73. If you were to compare these numbers back to the original column, the first value was a 1, the third value is a 3. The, second or the first value in this group is a 7, the third value is a 9. 21, 23, 71, and 73. How do these numbers compare to their counterpart in the first column? Hopefully you can see that they are two larger. Regardless of what the first value is, the third value is always two larger. So we call it x plus two. No matter what number I call x, if I add one to it, I get the second column. So 71 plus one is 72. If I add two to it, I get the third column. 71 plus two is 73. Seven, seven plus one is eight. Seven plus two is nine. This pattern is extremely useful for us when we're talking about consecutive integer problems. In fact, once we understand this idea that consecutive numbers are always x, one more than x, and two more than x, the rest of this becomes very, very simple for us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to call x that first number. We're going to call x plus 1 the second number. And we're going to call x plus 2 the third number. The problem says if we find their sum, or if we were to take those three things and add them together, our result should equal 264. That's my equation. I take my first number plus my second number plus my third number, and I get 264. That is the hardest part of solving this. From here, it's just simple computation. x plus x plus x makes 3x. 1 plus 2 makes 3. This simplifies to 3x plus 3 equals 264, which is a very simple two-step equation. Property of equality to get rid of the 3. Simplify. Multiply both sides by 1 third to get rid of the 1, or to get rid of the 3, turn it into a 1, and x ends up being an 87. Notice x is our first number x plus 1 would be 1 bigger than that, which is 88. x plus 2 is 2 bigger than that, which would be the 89. These are the three numbers that are consecutive that add up to be 264. You can even check that if you like. 87 plus 89 plus, uh, plus 88 is 264. And of course, I'm going to give my answer in a sentence. Every consecutive integer problem can be set up and solved this exact same way. If you are aware of that relationship, they're very easy problems to solve. If you don't know that relationship, it can become very, very, very challenging very quickly. Tell you what, why don't you take a second, pause the video, and try this one on your own. The sum of three consecutive integers is 141. What are the numbers? When you restart the video, I'm going to very quickly go through these. Hopefully you've done that. Hopefully you've defined your variable, which we'll do every time, x, x plus 1, and x plus 2 for our three numbers. 
The problem says if I add those three things together, my sum is 141. So I add those three things together, it has to equal 141. And from there, it's just simple computation. 3x plus 3, property of equality, property of equality. Your solution for x is 46. 46 is the first number. The second number is always one bigger than that. The third number is two bigger than the 46. Your three numbers are 46, 47, and 48. And you can check that to see that they work and give your answer in a sentence. When I created this slide, it was actually very easy because the pattern stayed the same. All I had to do was change this 141, change the 141, and then work my way through the calculations here. So the cutting and pasting made it very, very easy to do. That uh, I mentioned that not because I want you to be impressed with my PowerPoint skills, but rather because I want you to see that we're really doing the same exact thing every single time. Be sure to keep your work neat and organized. Make sure you define your variables. Make sure you answer in a sentence. That's the first pattern today. The second is very similar to that. It says the sum of three consecutive even integers is 192. What are the numbers? Now just like before we're going to be adding three numbers together. If you know what consecutive even numbers are this is going to be very simple. If you don't know what consecutive even numbers are this is going to be very very difficult. So let's make sure we know what those are. Here's an example of consecutive even integers. They are going to be numbers that appear in sequence run right after the other, but they're all going to be even. I probably need to go back and write the word even in here. They're consecutive even numbers that appear in sequence one right after the other. Let's see if I can go back to here. Oh, that's nice. Notice 2, 4, and 6 are three even numbers that appear in a row. 10, 12, and 14, even numbers that appear in a row. 88, 90, 92, negative 8, negative 6, negative 4. And we're going to do the same thing we did last time. We're going to allow this first column to be our x. And we're going to look at how the second column and the third column compare. When you look at 2 and see 4, when you look at 10 and see 12, when you look at 88 and see 90, when you see negative 8 and negative 6, what do you notice each time? Hopefully you've noticed that the things in the second column are two larger than our original number, which means that the first column is x, the second column has to be x plus 2. Compare the first and third, 2 and 6, 10 and 14, 88 and 92, negative 8 and 4. Do you see the relationship there? How does that third column compare to the first? In every case, it's 4 larger. So any consecutive even numbers can be expressed as x for the first, x plus 2 is the second, and x plus 4 as the third number. That makes this very easy to solve. First number is x, second number is x plus 2, third number is x plus 4. Let's write our equation. The sum of those, or adding those together, should equal, there's is, 192. So let's add them together. x, x plus 2, and x plus 4 make 192. And from there, it's just simple algebra again. Until we get back to x being equal to 62. If x is 62, if the number in the first column is 62, the number in the second column has to be 64, and the number in the third column has to be 66. You can even check that to see if they actually add up to 192. But make sure, whatever you do, you give your answer in a sentence. Consecutive odds. Let's take a look at those. They are consecutive odd numbers. They appear in sequence one right after the other. Here again, I probably need to go back and write the word. Lose my clicker here. There we go. Pointer options. Anyway, we'll just skip that and do that later. Okay, consecutive odd numbers appear in sequence one after another. 1, 3, 5, 15, 17, 19, 61, 63, 65, negative 13, negative 11, negative 9. 
first column is x, look at the second column. Do you see the relationship? Hopefully you see that they are also two larger. And the last column is four larger than the original. Notice that the consecutive odds pattern is the same as the consecutive evens pattern. In fact, I even forgot to change this to the word odd. I'll need to go back and fix that. That's kind of nice for us because we really don't even have to remember that um, two different formulas. We can use the same formula for both. But I do always mention the odd formula because some people have a reaction where they say this is x, this is x plus 1, and this is x plus 3 because they're thinking if we're dealing with odds that they have to add odds. But that's not the case. If you take an odd, add an even to it, it stays odd. Add an even to it, it stays odd. Let's set this up and solve it. Notice I still have x, x plus 2, and x plus 4. I've just written over here to the side because I always define my variables. The problem says if I add those three things together, x, x plus 2, and x plus 4, it is or should equal 117. And there's your formula. Little algebraic computation, you come up with x being 37. The next number has to be 2 larger, which is 39. And the next one is 4 larger, which is 41. You can check it if you like and give your answer as a sentence. Here again, consecutives and consecutive evens and odds are fairly simple to do if you... Um, if you take the time to understand the pattern and commit that to memory. That's one I would, uh, if you were in my class, I would actually put that on a chart on the wall and I would leave it there for the rest of the year so that we can always refer back to it. Now, this slide has three examples. This is just here for you. We're not going to work through the entire thing as a group, but I would recommend pausing, um, trying those on your own, and then I'm going to quickly put the results up or, or the steps as I would do them up here so you can check your own work. I'm probably not going to do a whole lot of discussion on these though. Define your variable, write the equation and solve it, find x plus should be x plus 1 and x plus this should be 2 and there's your three numbers. Over here x, x plus 2 and x plus 4, write the equation, solve, there's your next two values, answer in a sentence. Lastly x, x plus 2 and x plus 4, there's your solution, there's x plus 2 and x plus 4, and there is the solution. And there again, I did those fairly quickly for the sake of the video. If those were confusing to you, you might want to go back and watch the slides on consecutives, consecutive evens, and consecutive odds a second time. Uh, seeing those examples again might help you with these. This is the first three consecutive, consecutive even, consecutive odd of five we're going to do today. The next one deals with geometry. Um, it says one angle in a triangle is three times as large as another. The third angle is 60 degrees less than the sum of the other two angles. Find the measure of each angle. There's a couple things we need to pick up on in this slide. First of all, is this. Whenever we're doing geometry, it's always helpful to draw a picture. Since this problem is about triangles, I've gone ahead and I've drawn a triangle over here. Now, these angles aren't actually the measures of the final solution because I don't know what those measures would be. Instead, it's just some generic triangle to guide my thinking as I begin to prepare um, this equation. The first thing we would normally do is make sure we understood what the variables stand for. When I read through here, it says, um, we, we find our variables from the question. It says, find the measure of each angle. Find the measure of each angle. This triangle is going to have three different angles that might all have three different measures. In order for me to do this, I'm going to have to find a way to describe or define all three of those. Now, up until now, we would say x equals, and we would write out a word description, x equals first angle, x equals second angle, x equals third angle. But if you've gone and taken the time to draw the triangle, you can actually use your picture as the definition. So when it says one angle in a triangle is three times as large as another, this description right here tells me about two of the angles. I have one angle that I don't know, and I have a second angle that I don't know. All I know is the second angle is three times as big as the first. So, 
If I call the first unknown x, I can describe that second angle as being three times as large, or 3x. We're then told that the third angle is 60 less than the sum of the other two angles. Here's part of the reason why we did direct translations first, because this can be directly translated into an expression to go in that third angle. 60 less than, that means minus 60, the sum, or the answer to an addition problem, of the other two angles. Well, the other two are 3x and x. So I need to add these together and take away 60. And there you go. All of that information is given to you in the problem. But what we do with that information is not given. Is not given. They are making an assumption that you know something about the angles of a triangle that you may or may not know. If you know the thing they're assuming you know, this is a very easy problem. If you don't know that relationship, you're going to find yourself just kind of staring at it, wondering what it is you don't see. Do you know what they're asking you or what they assume you know? Hopefully, you realize something called the triangle sum theorem which says the sum of the measures of the interior angles of any triangle will always add up to be 180 degrees. Or in other words, all the angles have to add to 180. As soon as I know all of these add up to 180, that's the hardest part of the problem. All I have to do is take my first angle plus my second angle plus all of this is the third angle and have it equal 180. That's the hardest part of the problem. Once you've done that, it's just a little bit of algebraic computation until you find out that your angle is 30 degrees. Now, that means that this one is 30 degrees. The next angle should be three times as large. Three times 30 would give us 90. And the last angle would be three times 30 plus 30 minus 60, which is 60 degrees. Now, notice in this picture, this doesn't look like a 90 degree angle, and our 60 degree angle is drawn smaller than our 30 degree angle. Remember, we didn't know what these were at the beginning of the problem. We just drew a random triangle so that we would have a place to stick our values. If we wanted to, we could go back and draw it to scale. By the way, you can check that those all add up to 180 degrees, and make sure you give your answer in a sentence. Here's another one of these. Um, I'd like to give you a second to try that on your own, and then I'm going to run through it very, very quickly with you. Uh, go ahead and pause the video. My first angle is always x. One angle in the triangle is twice as large as the other, so I know my next angle is 2x. The third is 56 less than the first. 56 less than the first. Well, the first was x. So this one's x subtract 56. Find the measure of each angle. Here again, if you know that all the angles have to add up to 180, this is very easy. Take the first plus the second plus the third equals 180, and then it's just a little bit of algebraic computation. Once you know the first angle is 59, the second should be twice as big, and the third should be 56 less than 59 which is 3. Once again, notice nothing here is drawn to scale. You can even check to make sure it adds up to 180, but make sure you give your answer in a sentence. Last type of problem. Once again, this is another geometry problem. It says the length of a rectangle is twice the width. The perimeter is 24 meters. Find the length and width. Once again, we're looking for two things here, a length and a width, a length and a width. Since there's two things that we have to find, just like in the triangle problem, I'm going to go ahead and um, define these together um, where one of these values is going to be an x and the other is going to be a, um, a relationship based on x or an expression based on x. Notice the length of the rectangle is twice the width. Notice this phrase twice the width. I don't actually know the width, but whatever it is, I'm going to double that. That's my 2x. My width then 
must be x because double the width to x, this must be x. Notice I am labeling all the sides. I would make that a habit of labeling all the information you have because it will help prevent you from making some careless mistakes. Now, the thing we have to know here is how we find perimeter. If you know how to find perimeter, this is very easy. If you don't know how to find perimeter, this is going to be virtually impossible. The definition of perimeter is the sum of all the sides. Or in other words, add all the sides. Notice I all caps and underlined all the sides. The reason I did that is people have a tendency when they start adding uh, their sides to get perimeter, they have a tendency just to add two of the sides instead of to make their way all the way around. That's the other reason why I labeled all four sides is to prevent us from making that careless mistake. When I add those all together, the problem says the perimeter is 24. So I make it equal 24. Notice they didn't tell us what perimeter is, but if you know what perimeter is, this is very easy. Let's just perform some algebraic computation. And you get x equals 4 meters. Um, notice this m is meters. It's not a variable like everything else. 4 meters. If the width is 4 meters, the length should be double that, which is 8 meters. If you add all those together, 4 plus 4 plus 8 plus 8 is, wow, 24. It's 24. Got a little typo there. It is 24, which is what we expected it to be because that's what we were told it would be at the beginning. Make sure you give your answer in a sentence. Once again, when two items are unknown, it is always helpful to try and keep this limited to a single variable. So if it says twice an unknown, just know that this is going to be your x and your other value will be twice that. Here's one more for you. Try this one on your own real quick. I'd suggest pausing the video in order to do that. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and go on. It says the length is 5 less than triple the width. So I did 5 less than triple the width. Notice I'm labeling both sides. If the width is x, then I'm going to go ahead and fill that in. Perimeter is adding all sides. So I add those together. Here's a length plus a length plus the width plus the width is 118. Little algebra there. Your width comes out as 16 centimeters. Your length should be three times that, take away five. Three times 16 is 48, take away five is 43. You can even check by adding all the sides. Be sure to give your answer in a sentence. Hopefully that's been worthwhile for you. These are three or five, depending on how you count them, of the most common types of algebra patterns you might see early on in Algebra 1 that can be solved in a single variable. There are some others. We'll pick those up in the next couple of slides, but I think this is probably sufficient for today. As always, thank you for watching. If this is helpful to you, feel free to like and subscribe. Please leave me a comment in the comment section if you have anything that I could do better um, or if um, you have some suggestions. Uh, thank you for watching. Best of luck to you all. Have a great day.